Welcome to Tiki Central Canada. Ever wonder what's in that cool, refreshing drink that you just have to have on that hot summer's day? Mmm, me too. Picture a man going on a journey beyond sight and sound. He has left society, he has entered Tiki Central with palm trees, beach sand, blue skies, and God, get me a drink now! Here are your hosts, Craig and Cam, and their wacky views in drinks, life, and maybe information? Hey folks, and hey, how we doing? It's Craig from Tiki Central Canada, and uh, this is a very special episode. We are coming from Algonquin College, the bartending program. And uh, so this is actually part two of Algonquin College, let's call it that. And so if you notice, it's really kind of quiet on the other end there. Cam is not here, unfortunately, uh, but I do have a, hey, I got a surprise. Mike is back. Can hey, guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm back for another round of our fun information sessions. So wait, is this like Jason? So you're back? <laughs> uh, I like to think of like the Terminator. Okay. All right. So Mike, how about uh, a little fun fact about you and uh, who you are? Oh, well, I'm Mike. known Craig a little while now, and here I am. My part-time okay. away from work, I... Uh, I like to work on uh, my tap dancing. It's something I picked up recently, and uh, I'm getting better, but... Wait, do you, yeah. do you, okay, so is there special shoes you have to have for this? Oh, there are, but uh, I, I did not wear them today. There's so much clip pop oh, going man. on, you know? No, so too, but I bet you your neighbors <laughs> below you must just love you. I, I'm on the bottom level, so it's perfect, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, you're good. It's quite considerate looking for an apartment in that aspect, so... Well, because, I mean, I imagine when you first start tap dancing... You're like out, oh, of, it's you're out of sync. It's more like so an episode of Stomp it, or something, you know? It's, it's like that poor parent that has their kid doing <laughs> trumpet lessons, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, not good. Yeah, exactly. That's where you get a new set of headphones, right? <laughs> <laughs> so also to the show, we also have a uh, guest a student, actually, that graduated from the, the bartending program, Spencer. Hello, and... hello. My name is Spencer. I'm a graduate of the bartending program at Algonquin. And uh, fun fact about myself, I like to drink. Oh, well, there you go. Well, then you're in, you're in the right profession there. Okay, right. here you go. And also, Shelly did a return. Uh, she's doing a return today, so she's also helping us out as well. Hey, everybody. There we go. Cool. Very cool. So, uh, so Spencer, you graduated from the program. Was it last year you graduated from the program? Yeah, it was last year in April. And so, so far, what are you thinking so far coming out of the program, getting into the industry? What are you finding so far? Uh, the, the program itself, it's, it's a good, like, it gives you a good foundation. You learn, like, a lot of introductory courses into everything um i got a job at riviera thanks to one of the teachers and once you get out and start learning more about just like cocktails in general it's like spirit forward cocktails classic cocktails there's just so much information out there so also too like you mentioned something about the program so if you're interested in doing the program and you're kind of hesitant but like well how do i finish the program and then move on into the real world Networking, right? So Antonio's, Absolutely. I know Antonio's personally, and he is amazing actually getting students out into the real world, like the interaction and getting the networking going. 100%. I would say that's probably the biggest thing you'll take away from this program. Like you'll learn a lot from the program itself, the, the teachers, yeah. but like actually making those connections with all the teachers. Right, because actually these, a lot of these teachers, uh, Justin is one of your, you actually, you work with Justin, right? Yeah, yeah, he's one of the bartenders at Riviera. Exactly, and he actually also is a professor here, and then also too, like I said, he, he works with you, so he, he networks you into the into the real real field. Exactly. So he works really good. So um, what drink are we talking about today there, Craig? So the drink that we're uh, sloshing back here today is actually the Bacardi Cocktail. The Bacardi Cocktail, oh. That's good. Is this a traditional tiki beverage? So, no, it's actually not a tiki cocktail. I know. <gasps> then why are we talking about it today? Stunned faces, like what? <laughs> the reason why we're talking about this cocktail is because it actually has history. And if you know me, and actually some of these guys will verify, uh, Shelly for sure, she actually did one of my lectures. Uh, came to one of my lectures. The history of the drink. So as a good solid bartender, you're gonna know the history of your drinks. And this is one of those amazing drinks that actually has a really cool history to it. And also the the, the origin of it is from the Caribbeans. So that's why we're doing this drink today. Very nice. How did this one come to be? So this drink actually started back in Cuba in 1917, and it became more and more popular, obviously, during Prohibition. So the reason why in Prohibition uh, it became more popular because rum was a surplus. There was lots of rum everywhere, and so then it actually was also referred to as the Bacardi. Okay, interesting. 
It's not every day you hear a drink getting popular during Prohibition, eh? I know, because <laughs> lack of alcohol, right? Yeah. Oh. No alcohol, but this is really good. So uh, what's in this one? <laughs> it's quite tasty. So uh, also, too, I just wanted to get a little bit of a tidbit there. So the reason why in Cuba it was popular, because Cuba was only a 90-minute flight. So basically, it's like us flying to Montreal. So if we fly to Montreal... So let's say, example, in Ottawa, we can't drink beer or liquor. But, oh, hey, let's take a plane ride to Montreal, and, hey, we can have all the spirits and oh, drinks yeah, we want. that makes sense. Guess what? Montreal becomes the hot spot for all of us now, right? That's so true. So it's the same thing. Cuba was a 90-minute flight from Florida, and so I'll see all the Americans flooded in into Cuba during Prohibition. And so the recipe, yes, very simple. It's basically a daiquiri, which we've talked about before, which is simple three ingredients. So basically your rum, your lime juice, and your sugar. Uh, which we also talked about in a, a previous episode, actually, that that was actually made back in the Navy and the pirate de- de- generation, not uh, as we know it in 1970s or even in the early 40s. Okay. So the re- recipe for this is very easy. It's a one and a half ounces of rum, and that's going to be a Bacardi rum. Uh, oh, hence ha- the name, I guess, eh? Well, it's the name. Ah, I'm so smart. <laughs> Boy, I'm so glad you're on the show, Mikey. It's kind of interesting to picture pirates just, you know, sailing around drinking daiquiris all day. <laughs> I know. Kind of goes against their image, eh? <laughs> I'm just saying, are they, are they dancing and frolicking around the, the deck as they uh, drink these things? Because <laughs> it's not exactly, well, I mean, yes, it, it, men do drink daiquiris, but it's more of a, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to stereotype, but it is a more of a feminine drink, if I correctly be thinking, right, Spencer, in some ways, you think? Uh, I mean, there's some suspicion in some people's minds that it's a girly drink. Right. I think it's more, it really depends on what you're into, exactly. right? Exactly. So I don't like mind one in the, in the summer months, you know? It's definitely hot it's day so, on the patio. So, Mike, yeah. are you going to be drinking a daiquiri off the patio this uh, summer there? Only if you make them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it is a kind of a funny drink you think about, daiquiri being pirates, because it's just not something you think about. It, those two don't seem to coincide with each other. So, anyways, back to the recipe. So, it's one and a half ounces of rum, a half ounce of lime juice, and then a quarter ounce of grenadine. That's it? That's it. That's quite small. I know. So it actually is a small drink, but back then, don't remember, the rum was 80% alcohol. Oh, much stronger, eh? Not 40 mm. like we know it today. So 80% alcohol, that's pretty powerful on its own. Um, and then also, too, this was actually put into a coupe glass. Oh. Yes. A coupe. A coupe. Hey, oh, wait, wait, wait. So Spencer actually knows the story to the behind the coupe and let, and let him explain exactly what the history of the coupe is. Yeah, just a little fun fact. The coupe was modeled after Marie Antoinette's breast. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right, Mike. You're hanging on to some breasts, sir. So it's a boob glass. It's a boob glass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly why the pirates like love daiquiris so much. Oh, that all makes so much sense. <laughs> 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 hanging on to those boobs. <laughs> <laughs> but they got to do something, right? Yeah, that's true, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so why is this coupe glass your favorite glass? So the reason why the coupe glass is it was one of my favorites is that, first of all, it's a drink that has no ice in it. So usually if you make a drink in a, in a, in a coupe glass, it usually has no ice in it. So it's not a, a heavily a high-volume drink. It's uh, Also, too, it's a smaller drink, so you kind of savor it. Because don't forget back then, like I said, the, the alcohol was very powerful. And a lot of the drinks that you see in a coupe glass usually these days are kind of the martini kind of category. Uh, I'm sure Spencer can kind of back that up. So you, you don't want a lot of it, and you kind of savor it throughout the night. You kind of slip on it. You don't clock it back. Okay. It's, it's not a gulping drink. And since there's noise, it's not going to get diluted. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that handy. too. Hey, yeah, I never thought of that. One. And it's also more exotic. I mean, you, you see someone holding onto a coupe glass. It's like, ooh, this and you know. Uh, a little tidbit, by the way. Champagne actually used to be served, whatever it was served, actually was in a coupe glass. It was not in a flute. Let's go through some questions for you. Uh, so what is your favorite glass uh, that you think of when you think of glassware? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I think every glass is kind of picked particularly for a cocktail right but if i had to choose one i think nick and nora is currently my favorite uh glass cool and if you don't know what a nick and nora is what exactly is a nick and nora spencer it's sort of like a cross between say like a coupe and a martini glass okay so it's like it's not as spread out as a martini glass it kind of curves a little bit it's a little more sleek and i think it's something that you learn in this class as well from the students i'm sure shelly can vouch for as well is that glassware is very important when it comes to drinks I mean, some of them actually serve a purpose while they're in that glass. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sure. And we're still learning about all this. You'd be like me. Basically, you're shopping for glassware. And like, it's funny because uh, I went shopping for rock glasses and my girlfriend like picked up something that was super cheap, whatever. And I'm like, she's like this. And I'm like, no, wrong. It was glass. Because <laughs> it was glass. It wasn't crystal. 
And so, oh, okay. like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want a rocks glass, you want something that's heavy. You oh, want yeah. a thick, you know, thinking like you can take somebody out with it. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> example. Hey, no, no, I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, when you get, become a bartender and you become more and more involved in it, the glassware is so important. And so then when you go looking for it, it is hard to find. And, um, because even online, if you bought online, you don't even know what you're going to get. So you have to really do some research on it. Do you have a special place you go to on a, like a favorite store, like a restaurant supply store or anything like that? Uh, so one of the places I, 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 I'm one of these guys, as soon as I go in the mall, if there's a Stokes in the mall, uh, I'm it's there. your first stop. I'm there, yeah. <laughs> I can't walk I can't walk past the Stokes. I have to walk into it. Uh, Spencer, where, where do you get your glassware from, if you're just kind of curious? Riedel is our like wine company at Riviera. We get uh, most of those from from there. Mr. Flood, our, our bar manager, he's he's one in charge of like the the cocktail glassware, and uh, it, the glassware is amazing. I'm, he gets them from all over. But if, if you if you ever get a chance, come into Riviera, and uh, we'll take good care of you. They're they're amazing cocktails. Wait a minute. So where is Riviera? So that if someone knows doesn't know where it's it is, the downtown Ottawa area. It's on Spark Street. And so, what kind of food do they also serve it too? I'm just kind of curious. I've never been there actually. It's like comfort food, but it's it's fine dining, casual, and the servers are amazing. The cooks there. Honestly, I, I find this restaurant's the best in the city. It may sound a little biased because I work there. Because <laughs> you work there. <laughs> yeah. But. So um, what exotic cocktails did you guys make in this program that you took away from? So what are some of the cool cocktails you came from? I mean, did you made from the program? So I'll see you're going to make the staple ones like the daiquiri, like we talked about. Um, the Negroni, which you love. I know you told me when we talked yeah. previous before the show, you said you love the Negroni. But is there is there some really cool cocktails? Because I know, especially in the mixology class, that you guys get uh, exotic and very unique. A monkey's lunch. So what's a, what's a monkey's lunch? I think there's some banana liqueur in there. There's a little bit of milk. I don't. I, I've forgotten the actual recipe, but I just remember laughing when I heard monkey's lunch. Right, <laughs> like. It just sounds like a very appetizing no, cocktail. No, wait. If I remember correctly, actually, I tried that one, and there was a banana as a, as a garnish, I think it was also in there as yeah. well. Oh, so it comes with a little snack, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And that's the thing I see that Spencer actually just made a good point, and uh, I, I get all the time. So people come up to me and go, hey, Craig, well, can you give me a recipe for blank, blank, blank? And I'm like, well, hang on. Let me just check. Well, you don't know it? It's like, okay, if you don't make the drink, it's like a chef. If you don't make a dish for a year, then all of a sudden somebody goes, hey, can you make me this dish? Yeah, you got to go back and refer to your recipe because you first of all, you want to make it correctly. And second of all, you might not remember all the ingredients because you haven't made it for a year or something. So mm -hmm. it's always that illusion. People like, like people come up to me and like, oh, make this shot for me. And I'm like, okay, well, hey, let me go check. And it sounds funny because like everyone's like, oh, you see the bartender on the phone checking the recipe. Well, yeah, we haven't made it in a year. We're not going to make it correctly. We've got to check and make sure we know what the recipe is. Exactly. Yeah, we're to be safe to, and sorry. Trying to get you the best product possible, right? Exactly. It's kind of an illusion that everyone has. A, apparently, every bartender has a thousand recipes in their head, and we can just spit them out whenever we want. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Tell cool. that to my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. You have 15 <laughs> weeks now, Shelly. <laughs> you should be able to absorb some of it. <laughs> So speaking about that, Shelly, so what is your favorite uh, subject from the classes so far that you've done? Um, I like the Fridays because it's just wing it day. They give you stuff and you make whatever drink you can come up with in 30 minutes. So you really got to pull your uh, ideas out. Cool. So it's sort of like the black box process, right? Yeah. So you get something and all of a sudden you got 30 minutes to whip up something from it. Yep. Um, so far, how have you found that challenge? I mean... Well, last Friday, our ingredients were gin and a Hall's candy. Oh, my Interesting. God. Interesting. So what did you make from that? It was the flu destroyer. I could probably go for one of those right now. <laughs> okay, uh, I have to ask, what's what's in a flu destroyer? One ounce of gin, three hulls, white cranberry. That's true. We infused gin into the hulls. That's what it was. We had a new machine, the right, uh, yeah. CSI machine, and we infused the gin into the hulls Wait, candy. Did you say CSI? Or? CSI? That's what it's called, isn't it? Is that what it's called? Or is it ISU or something? I don't know. No, there's no U in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because every every person up this thing in CSI, like what crime crime units coming along and trying to figure out where the ingredients are. If you're really curious, go look on the Facebook page. It's on there. There you go. Yes, the Galco College actually for the bartending program does actually have a Facebook page, so check it out. For and sure. all these wonderful drinks are on there every Friday. So, what experience are you guys getting from the? Well, actually, uh, yeah, Spencer can definitely answer this. So, what experience are you getting in the real field that you basically helped you uh, like when you went through the program and you came out and now you're getting the real experience? What were some of the things that came out of the program that now it makes it much easier to do your job? Well, I think an aspect of the program is the volunteer works, the work that you do. Like, so you're you're required to do so many hours of either paid or volunteer work. 
in the industry and then you're able to graduate and uh, i ended up working with uh, made with love the competition i was a bar back for a couple of their events and getting a job at riviera as a bar back it kind of just made that transition like a lot a lot smoother right exactly and also too i think that mention just pointed out something and i kind of learned it last year because we we hired a, a, a student uh from last year that graduated i can't remember his name was now and he came to my bar to work for me and right off the bat he was like I don't want to learn the basics. I don't care about whatever, like the systems. I just want to make a bartending program. And he was so excited about like, I want to make great cocktails and I want to get them on the menu that I explained to him like, no, you have to pay your dues. And in this industry, you do. You have to be that bar back. You have to be the born and slender like behind a guy that's already has experience and see what he does and how he does things and learn from him and then move your way up to junior and senior and whatever. Like making a cocktail program or developing a cocktail program is something that it took me like 20 years to finally get that level. And so I think that a lot of people come out of the program or are thinking, okay, I'm going to be a bartender. Great. I'm just going to start making cocktails. Well, best thing to do is actually start from scratch, be the bar back, learn how, what they're doing, see what they're doing, watch them, ask questions, ask a thousand questions. And then also too, then like work on something a little more simple, work on a bar that's got just bar rail and wine maybe, and then work your way up and elevate from there. So you mentioned the made with love competition. Do you enjoy that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I bar back to last year for two of the events, had a great time. Uh, it was really good to meet like a lot of the competitors too, shake their hands, especially in Ottawa. Cause it's like, it's a smaller city. So this industry is kind of tight knit. Everybody kind of knows each other. So it was good to actually get my name out there. Oh, and uh, Florence, the organizer, she's she's amazing. Oh, Got yeah, to work yeah. with her. Actually, I'm working with Florence. Uh, well, we'll be working with Florence at the Mabel's Love competition that we're going to be there. And she's just a great girl. She's uh, got lots of information. She's always getting back to me about all this stuff. Mm. And uh, I went to the Mabel's Love competition uh, just as an observer last year. And I think that I loved about it was that there's still some secrecy to it. Right. Like all their cocktails are still some sort of secret ingredients or whatever, especially in the qualifiers. But then I saw also, too, uh, especially in the semis, that it's a community thing. It's like all these bartenders all know each other. Like you said, it's a very small community. They all know each other and they all are willing to share their secrets with each other and to make themselves grow into a better bartender, I think, is it was really cool. Which I think is like helping the industry in this city, too. Like it pushes it forward, right? Like. Sure, it's like competitive. Everybody's trying to win, but it's sort of pushing everyone forward. We're getting we're getting better and exactly, and, 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 and I think and getting it out there too, right? Like yeah. because I know some friends that went last year because I told them about it and they went to it and it was a learning experience for them. They were just like, "Wow, I didn't realize that these these fancy cocktails are out there." They always thought it was just you know the staple stuff and the wine and the, and the beer, and yeah, the bar rail stuff. And it's like, no, there's actually some really good cocktail and bars actually in Ottawa that make these cocktails. Yeah, Riviera is one of them. Come check us out. <laughs> I love how he plugs it in. <laughs> this is all about Gonquin College now. Okay, come on. <laughs> did you know? I did not know. Please tell me. Well, you ex <laughs> can you expand it on Cam's line there. Jeez, I don't know. Sorry, Are you trying Cam. to take his job there, Mike? A little what's bit. Going on? Trying to kick him out. Because <laughs> you're loving the free drinks is what's going on, right? It's, it's like... All right, so actually this is uh, part two to Prohibition because we talked about Prohibition in the last episode in the Did You Know uh, segment. And this is actually more of an expansion and more information about the Prohibition. So uh, December 18th, 1917, the 18th Amendment was actually created to try to ban the production and selling of alcohol uh, and not be consumed. And so if this amendment basically took some while to kind of get ratified. And on January 16th, 1919, the amendment was in place. So... You're like, well, wait a minute, Craig, didn't you say that the uh, prohibition was in the 1920s? Yes. So what they did is in January 1919, they're like, okay, the amendment's going to happen. It's going to take a year for it to get into place. So it's almost like they're warning people, okay. stockpile your liquor. A little transition <laughs> period, eh? <laughs> get all those rums you want, man, because you know what? In a year from now, it's not going to happen. So a lot of people actually did that. They actually stockpiled wine and booze in their basement waiting for this to happen in oh, 1920s smart. take advantage <laughs> it's like well, why you not can still get it right it's like a warning bell yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh did that work out very well for him or well obviously not so what ended up happening was that during the 1920s and even in the early 30s crime went up 
the gangs actually gained power uh, selling moonshine and alcohol to the public and were pretty well unstoppable. So the law tried to stop them, but what ended up happening was that either they would bribe these law enforcement guys with money, or they would tell them, like, you know what, if you don't take this money, no problem, we'll just kill your family. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nice, yeah, eh? No, they were uh, I, uh, tough I think, guys, eh? I think I'll take the money, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I would, too. <laughs> Alex, I'll take uh, $1,000 for surviving. <laughs> <laughs> So what ended up happening was that we also saw a new era, which is of speakeasy bars. Um, and what ended up happening was that it's funny because in this era that happened during Prohibition, women actually increased on how many women actually were drinking at the bar. So before that, before Prohibition, women were kind of not banned from drinking in bars, but it was kind of a, you know, no, no, I don't, you know, you stay home with the kids and I get to drink. And, More of a guy's come, outing. A guy's outing kind of thing. So then during Prohibition, women actually increased uh, being at the bars. So it actually increased that whole flow. And also, too, actually, jazz um, also became a big, huge part of the society in music, oh. in the music industry. So, yeah, very well, cool. A lot of the the big popular jazz artists came out, eh? That's right. Yeah, yes, for sure. Yeah. So uh, tell me more about these speakeasies. So a speakeasy actually is a hidden bar. Uh, it's usually in an attic or basement or back room. Uh, of a legit business. And some of the businesses actually that would be in the front. So basically the front of the building would be like the legit business. So it could either be like a soda shop or a flower shop or a funeral home. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine you're with your buddies? You're like, hey, dude, let's go have some drinks. Let's go to the funeral home. Go through the funeral home, out the back door, and into the speakeasy yeah, bar. A good spot to hide, though. I'm sorry, but if I was just a regular Joe walking up to a funeral home and seeing everyone all dressed up and laughing and going into a funeral home, I'm like, what the frig is going on? A funeral is a little too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> Everyone's dying to get into this funeral home. <laughs> oh, I like it. That's good. There we go. That's a, she, that's a true bartender right there. See, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, do these speakeasy bars. Did, were they successful? Did they get shut down often? Or No, so what ended up happening was that in the speakeasy bars, because they were very popular and they were very behind the scenes, things like mayors and police chiefs and celebrities actually started showing up at these speakeasy bars. So it was very popular for like the higher entity, be it the cops or the chiefs of police or mayors, even celebrities would show up. And so the thing is to get into speakeasy bar, and actually there are speakeasy bars existing today, by the way. Um, yeah, there's one in, in here in Ottawa. Pretty sure. Yeah, I can't remember where it is now. It's uh, is below, that the one on Somerset there? Yeah, below uh, Jabberwocky and uh, Union. It's, cool. It's hidden behind like a bookcase. Yeah. Yes, I Secret remember, door. Yeah. I'm yeah, just happy yeah. that I don't need a, a password like some of the old ones, eh? <laughs> I forget that password. A secret handshake or something. <laughs> Mike gets her uh, white chowder? No, that's not it. <laughs> and so exactly, so it would be a certain knock or password you would have to give at the door to get into a speakeasy bar. I've heard of some like... Uh, <laughs> And so, behind like telephone booths, you gotta have the right number. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You get you call them up, and they're on the other side. They answer like, "All right, I'll let you in." Yeah. So actually, in New York, there's a speakeasy bar, and there's um, they have zero advertising. They don't do any marketing, and so it's word of mouth. And what you do is you, like you said, you go into a booth. It's actually a bakery. So you go into this bakery, and you go into the telephone booth that they have there, and you dial a certain number that someone will tell you, and then the else, the door opens up, and the behind the, the booth, and it ends up in the bar. That's super fun. Yeah. So also too, um, to avoid raids, like also when raids would happen, they would warn their guests. So there would be like a back door or a secret exit to the building. And even bands that were playing in these bars would actually have a certain song they'd play to say, hey, folks, you need to get out. So it would be like closing time. <laughs> time. <laughs> it's time to get out of here, folks. Uh, the cops are coming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, what other things happened during Prohibition to allow the people to get their... Their booze? I guess you would say. So also, too, not just the bars were also getting alcohol. People were making alcohol at home. Like Homer on the yes. episode of The Simpsons there. Doing his, his <laughs> bathtub gins. That's right. A bathtub gin was actually was a terminology that was made back then. So you actually would take household items and make alcohol. Now, so this is actually was very dangerous. And lots of times you actually call it in illness or even death. So I, me, me and Cam talked about this one time about bathtub gym. I'm sorry, but you know what? The f I was banned from alcohol, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden had to like drink something that potentially could kill me. I think I'd be go back into my Pepsi or my Coke. 
If you had I'm a like, speakeasy behind a funeral home, this would be perfect for making bathtub gin. Exactly. You died. Oh, you drink. Yeah. Right there. They just lift the body, put it into the, in the casket. And uh, you got go. a whole Here batch of people coming back in the morning for the funeral. <laughs> well, no, the first, first of all, they gave the regards as they're buying on the way out the door. <laughs> That's right. All right, so we're going to go on to uh, mailbag. Oh, the mailbag. Yeah, you get to read the, the email. All yeah. right. Um, so this is an email from Emily asking, how do I become a bartender with no experience? Okay, so I'm going to answer this question, and then you guys can answer this question as well. I feel like we got... touched on it a little bit. but Yeah, we have during the show for sure. So one of the things you want to do is you want to memorize cocktails. And one of the things I explained to even Shelly, because we're in between podcasts that we talked about, Craig, where do you get your information? Well, lots of reading, lots of books, uh, lots of videos going on the internet, checking the internet. Now, my suggestion to you is to do exactly what I do. If you find a fact, check 10 other resources to make sure that that fact is legit. Because there's nothing worse than you're like, well, geez, I've got that off the internet. It's supposed to be the truth. We all know that's not the case. Learning basic bartending lingo. Example, when I go to a customer and ask them, they say, okay, they want a gin and tonic. My first thing I ask them is, you want a tall or short? And it's funny because actually I asked this question on Friday to one of my customers at uh, the pub. And he goes, you know what? That's the first time a bartender's ever asked me that question. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. Well, what's the difference? So a short basically is a one-to-one ratio of basically mixer to the alcohol. Pretty well, pretty close. You get into a tall, what is is that you basically now increasing the mixer and the liquor stays the same. So basically you're getting, if you want it to be not as potent, you don't want to taste the alcohol, you go to a tall glass. And so these are little things like that, the lingo that you are going to learn along the way as a bartender that is, is a good thing to do. Applying as a bar back, that's another one great one we just talked about for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Observing, watching somebody else and seeing how they're doing it, asking a thousand questions. And then practice makes perfect. So at my house, when I make drinks, I'm uh, practicing that drink all the time, lots of times. Of course, Norm, my girlfriend just loves it because every freaking weekend or every second weekend, the entire bar gets en- made into the kitchen and I just destroy the kitchen in the process. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, practice makes perfect. And I'm sure Shelly can say the same thing for the, the, the student that's actually in the class right now, that practice makes perfect, right? Yep. Drills, practice it, or just come take the course. That, that's a simple way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, Spencer, any uh, tips that you have for someone who wants to get in the bartending industry and uh, okay, wants I, to know? I think you said it perfectly, but just to expand on it, yeah, practice makes perfect. Even if it's just like trying to get your shake down for a cocktail, because like the shake, there's there's like some science happening in the cocktail shaker. Like you want to sort of understand what's going on. You want to have the perfect shake uh, pouring as well. You don't want to under pour, over pour. So just getting bottles and practicing with water, colored water, like in the program. Yeah, so example, so the shaker. So one of the things that when I first did cup bartending, and I'm sure you guys can concur, is that oh well, I just put the lid on it, I shake it, and I take the lid off. Well, no, there's actually a vacuum in there, mm. and so you have to hit the shaker just right so you can get the top off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of the things actually when I did the lecture here at Algonquin, uh, and Shelly can vouch for this, is actually my shaker is actually two metal pieces. So I don't have the glass on top. I actually have a metal piece. And the reason why is because through time I've learned from other bartenders that if when you bang it, sometimes that glass could potentially break. And I'm like, I don't want that happening to me ever. So I actually have two metal shakers, like the top and the bottom are both metal. I would recommend that as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that's what I mean. So practice makes perfect. I did notice also too, uh, just observing, watching students is the, and the thing you take for granted, pouring into a shot glass, the measurements. You yeah. think like, you know, well, that's just easy. I just take it from the big bottle and pour it into a small shot glass. Well, if you haven't done it, it is to get the exact, the one ounce exactly, it's practice. It's practicing in that, you know, getting your hand shaky and getting more confident about it, I think, more than anything. Yeah. So anything you want to add to that, by the way? Because you're actually in the program now. So definitely. Uh... It, it just opens up a wholeness. Like you said, all these, you don't think of this when you're at home making drinks. You don't think of, and oh, is my shake good? Is my pour okay? Is the, are, are the ratios right? You don't think of any of that. So if you want to be a bartender, go get this knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. So uh, that is our show. Let me explain who we are. We're uh, www.tiki. Uh, did you do an extra W in there? I don't know. You may have, but it's I may okay. have. Okay. <laughs> Just put three, though. Okay, more no more Bacardi cocktail for me. That's it. Uh, no, it's www.tikicentralcanada.ca or .com. And on there, you'll see uh, information about the new episode, i.e. this one. And also, too, some information about us and some history about Tiki. Also, too, a recipe page on there with all the recipes we've done throughout the time that we've been on show. And so if you want looking for a new recipe, maybe check it out. Also, a uh, link for episodes to stream the episodes live on your car radio, like that's why I do when I watch one of my podcasts. Um, also to a subscribe page. 
very important that we actually, uh, if you can, if you want to, you can subscribe. Because we don't have any brand names. We don't do any sponsorship. I like that there's no commercials on the show. And so to get that uh, through iTunes and Google Play, you have to have so many sponsors. And so that's something that's very important to me and to the show uh, for us to continue. So for sure, definitely uh, click on that. There's uh, iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, Spotify, YouTube. Any plot porn pretty well you can find us on. Pretty don't cool. forget to tell your friends too. Pass it on. Uh-huh. I want to thank uh, especially for showing up and uh, being a, a guest on it. It's great to actually hear someone actually has already been out of the program and actually in the field. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. I imagine you appreciate the program for what it is. Absolutely, I had a, I had a blast, learned a lot. Thank you for having me on, gentlemen. For sure, and Shelly for coming back and yeah. uh, being yeah, she's a student that's actually in the program right now. And like I said, if you want any more information, I will actually put on, I'm going to tell you guys what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a link on uh, this episode for a Gonquin bartending program. So if you uh, want more information, just go to our website, click on the link, and you can get more information about the program itself. And hey, maybe you too can be a bartender. Uh, I guess for that, uh, we're going to go uh, some more drinks. Uh, appreciate everyone listening. And uh, I guess uh, we'll say hi to Cam somewhere along the line. He's, in, he's not here. I guess everyone will say goodbye. All right. Cheers. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for Bye-bye. listening. Later. Well, I don't know about you, but I got informed. Guys, hey, guys, where's my drink? I do enjoy my basic percussion instruments, such as the cowbell and the, the triangle. The triangle. <laughs> Trying to work up my percussions up to the steel drum so I can play your tiki parties.